Well, today we got several things we want to cover. First of all, they finally arrived. All the CDs, and they're packed really nice, and the front of it is just like the front of the box for the Bible. Okay? Now, there are eight CDs for the Bible, one for commentary, one for appendices. Okay? We put a coupon out in the, um, the letter, and you can have as many as three sets. Now, for those who are here, we have a few up front you can pick up. Okay? Now then, we got another booklet coming, which is quite good. True Science Destroys... Darwin's evolution. Now, it'll be smaller than this, but this is just a proof text for the color. Then Randy Vild sent me something really nice. A little baby asleep, that's Photoshop, of course, on a faithful version in its original order. Then we have a spectacular picture How's that for a galaxy? That's something. So whatever God has out there for us, it's going to be really something. It's going to be a lot greater than anything we've ever thought of. You know, it's quite amazing when you stop and think, you know, about everything that God has made and created. It is so marvelous indeed. It's incredible. Okay? Now then, today we're going to cover some things. Some are in the news, some are questions, and so forth. But this raises an interesting question. The statue of Moloch that is going to be in front of a Catholic church in Rome. Now, Correction will be on display in museum, but I wonder how close to the Vatican that will be. Very interesting indeed. Okay. So, remember what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. First chapter. There is nothing new under the sun. That which has been will be. So there we have it. Okay. Now then, here's something very interesting. Let's go to Deuteronomy 16. Okay. Deuteronomy 16. And it mentions the three seasons. Let's look at them for just a minute here. Okay. Talks first of all about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Talks about Passover, but this is for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first eight verses. Then it talks about counting for Pentecost. Then it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles, which includes the last great day. Now think about what happens that these feasts depict. What happens? Harvest. harvest, that's correct. What else? What does the harvest picture? Resurrection. resurrection. Christ was resurrected where? During unleavened bread. The saints are going to be resurrected where? At Pentecost. What's going to happen during the millennium? Well, people are going to enter into the kingdom of God, right? Tabernacles, last great day. What is that? Resurrection. 
So all three of these feasts have the ultimate depiction of the resurrections of God. See? So in 1 Corinthians 15, let's go back there for a minute. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes of this, not quite in exactly the same way, but it covers it. Okay? So it says, <clears throat> verse, um, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who fall asleep. Okay? For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. What is the order? First resurrection, right? Then we have during the millennium. Then we have the last great day. And that pictures those who never had a chance for salvation, plus the incorrigible wicked. See, So it covers all. Those are the orders. Then those who are Christ at his coming. Now, this is a very interesting verse. Because those who say you go to heaven, how are they going to contradict this verse? Those who are Christ are not going to be raised until he comes. Okay? Then he says, then the end comes. We covered that last week, so we won't go over it again. Quite an interesting thing to have it that way. So, okay, David Reeves was the one who sent that to us. Okay, we'll have a couple articles on the Pope here. Can't get away from that. World leader of the Salvation Army, General Brian uh, Peddle Metisius, met with Pope Francis. Wonder what that's going to lead to. Okay. Here's another one. Pope Francis declares that Christian fundamentalists are a scourge. Okay. That includes us, includes all the Protestants. Okay. So beware of the fundamentalist groups, everyone has his own. In Argentina, too, there is a little fundamentalist corner. Let us try with fraternity to go forward. Fundamentalism is a scourge, and all religions have some kind of fundamentalist first cousin there, which forms a group. So we're all lumped in with terrorists. Maybe I didn't make it clear. The Pope is saying this. See? Again, there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been will be. Okay? So there's quite a long article on that. Now back to the nonsense of modern PC. British court in transgender, transgender case, Bible belief is incompatible with human dignity. So that's how far they're going, okay? This poor doctor lost it because he did not want to call an obvious man with a beard because this man was deluded into thinking he was a woman and he obviously was a man. So they fired him. So that's how the world's going, okay? ACLU sues to make sure unborn babies can be dismembered piece by piece in cruel, inhuman abortions. And that's what they do, especially in the 
first and second trimester, they destroy them as they are aborting them. It's quite a hideous thing indeed. So there you go. Then we had this, how many saw it on television where this young woman got up and said, well, the only way we can avoid uh, global warming and save the world is that we have to start eating the babies. Now you think, oh, well, that's out there and that's crazy. But every crazy thing starts out that way, right? So it's going to get more and more. Okay. Now then. Then it says, where's the one? Okay. Then there's the one which um, the company that buys the baby parts that Planned Parenthood wants to pull apart. Okay. Now, who is our latest evangelist in the political realm? Mayor Pete. Yep. Mayor Pete. You know what he says about a, a abortion? That a baby is not a child or a person until it takes its first breath. Now, why is that wrong? The spirit lives in the child. The, the spirit gives the child life before it's born, so it's living. Okay. But how does the baby get oxygen, though it can't breathe in the womb? From the mother's blood through the placenta. So the baby, in fact, is partaking of the breath of life through the mother. But his evangelism is going to, you know, turn a lot of people on to a lot of bad things. But think of it. Here he is, a homosexual, who is married to a man, and he's the woman. I mean, think of that. That's crazy. And he brings his husband to some of the rallies. And all of the people are hooray, hooray, hooray. So when it says Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, you know that's true. Okay? You know very well that's true. Okay? Okay. Now, let's cover something that we need to cover from last week. Let's come to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Okay? Daniel 7. And let's look at one of those scriptures where those who say that the Father is coming to the earth for the millennium. Now, the Bible doesn't support that in any way, and neither does Daniel, the seventh chapter. <clears throat> okay, let's pick it up here in verse 13. And I saw visions in the night, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. That is the return of Christ. Okay. Could also be his ascent going to heaven to be accepted by the Father. Okay. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near to him. So that has to be his ascent on the first day of the week, the wave sheaf offering day, when he went to the Father. And the dominion and glory was given to him in the kingdom, and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, 
which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. All right, let's go on and see if there's another clue here. I, Daniel, was distressed in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head alarmed me. And I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth concerning all of this. And he told me and made me to know the interpretation of these things. The great beast, which are four, are four kings which shall come, which shall arise out of the earth. So a king and a kingdom then can be synonymous. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, who devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the rest with his feet. And of the ten horns which were on his head, and of the other horn which came up, and before them three fell, even of the horn that had eyes and a mouth speaking very boastful things, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Okay? So, this has got to be the papacy, which in the end run is going to have all religions back home with Rome. Now, continuing. And I watched, and that same horn made war with the saints and overcome them, overcame them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay. Does it say that the Most High came to the earth? No, it doesn't. It doesn't say he came to the earth. Okay. The ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and break it in pieces. Revelation 13, Revelation 17 combined. <clears throat> and the ten horns out of that kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. We covered the chart on that last Sabbath. And another shall arise after them and shall be different from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the set times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and half a time. Okay? Again, it doesn't show the Most High coming to the earth. Okay? And then it says, all kingdoms shall serve him. All right? Now, let's come to the book of Revelation and see something, Revelation 15. Now, we have a very interesting thing, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Hebrews, the second chapter, it says that Christ is going to come before the Father and say, Behold, the children you have given me. That's everybody in the first resurrection. Okay. Now, let's ask the question. When the saints are resurrected, where will they be? See a glass. 
Revelation 15, verse 2. Then I saw a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had gotten a victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the lyres of God. Now those are stringed instruments. Okay. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and awesome are your works, Lord God Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the saints. Okay. Now, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, and all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Now, if that is open, is this where the Father is going to look and see all the resurrected saints on the sea of glass? In other words, will the Most High come to a point just above the sea of glass and see all of his children. Very possible, because the temple of the tabernacle was open. doesn't say that they saw God. Okay. Then after they, they received the seven vials, okay, verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power, and no one was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So again, maybe God the Father comes down that close to the earth, because it's going to be a formal ceremony with God the Father, Jesus Christ, the saints, everything that we're going to receive, new name, where, what we're going to do, what our assignments will be, all of that will take place on the sea of glass. Okay, But nowhere do we find God the Father on the earth. Okay, Let's come to Revelation 20. Good comment. Isn't a wedding going to take place on the sea of glass and a wedding feast? Who's going to conduct the wedding? Did the husband ever conduct the wedding? No. Who do you suppose will conduct the wedding? Let me ring my cowbell, because I'm giving some supposes. Don't you think that the father would be the one who would perform the wedding? All right. So then he does have to come close enough so we can see him, he can see Christ, and all of those in the first resurrection. There's going to be the wedding feast, we'll see a little later. Not everybody in the first resurrection is going to be part of the bride. Okay. Because it says, blessed are those, let's go over here to Revelation 19, okay, Verse 9, Revelation 19, and he said, Right, <clears throat> blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, we have the parable in Matthew 22 about the wedding feast being ready and people were called to it. See? So, Let's look, we're going to look and see here in just a minute, concerning the 144,000. And try and clarify some things there. Okay. Now then, let's come to, let's come to Revelation 7. 
there are two 144,000 groups in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Now we're going to see those are two different groups. Okay. So, first of all, one of the things that this tells us, we'll get into it in just a bit, the first 144,000 are from the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? Now, so hold your place here in Revelation 7 and come to Hosea 5. Now, others' prophecies show that Israel will be in captivity, correct? Because of their sins. All right? So let's come to Hosea 5, and let's see a prophecy of what God is going to do, and then we will get a time frame from this as well. Okay? Let's pick it up in verse 10. See, now the things that are going to happen at the end, it's going to happen to all the ten tribes, plus Judah, and then Benjamin and Levi as well. Verse 10, the rulers of Judah were like those who move a border. I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim, that's the ten tribes, is crushed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after vanity. Therefore, I'm like a moth to Ephraim and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to the Assyrian and sent to king contentious. That has to be the beast power. Yet, he could not heal you nor cure your wound, you of your wound. For I will be to Ephraim as a lion and as a strong lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away and I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go. I will return to my place until they confess their guilt and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me earnestly. Okay. Now then, chapter 6 goes right on with it, verse 1. So here's what they say. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he is torn he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. Now notice carefully verse 2. Now as we read this, remember, a day in prophecy is in fulfillment how long? A year. Yeah, a year. Correct. Okay. Verse 2. After two days, two years, so this shows we're two years into the tribulation. After two days, that means completed. He will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight. Now then, that begins with 144,000. Okay. Now then, how long is the tribulation. Three and a half years. If two years have been fulfilled, how much time is left? A year and a half. Okay. So let's go back here to Revelation 7. Okay. This is why you find Let's come back to Revelation 6 for just a second here. 
Revelation 6.12. Okay. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the hair of sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its untimely figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the heavens departed as a scroll, like a scroll that is being rolled up. Now, I'll ring my cowbell again. Could this be on Pentecost or just a little before Pentecost? We don't know. But if two years, there you go. That puts it right about Pentecost. Okay? And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, the chief captains, the powerful men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay? Now, Christ has a throne. And he's going to bring the wrath of God. Okay. This would be the beginning of the day of the Lord. Because the tribulation of against Israel was to last two years, and in the third year he would raise them up. Okay. And then it gets even worse after that when it goes to the rest of the world. Okay. For the great day of his wrath, day fulfilled in prophecy, is a year. What about that six-month period? Well, what did it say happened with the earthquake because of the heavens being rolled back like a scroll? Well, there's going to be a lot of work to clean up and get things so that they can get up and start fighting again, right? So there is this pause. And what is this pause? Revelation 7. Now, a little uh, concerning the last verse there, verse 17 of chapter 6. His wrath, the day of his wrath, that's a year. But also, at first, many believe that it's Christ. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay. But later, Satan's going to deceive them into believing that they are what? Aliens from outer space. Okay. So here, if this is Pentecost, then what happens in chapter 7 and how long that takes we don't know. Okay. So let's read it here. Chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Well now the earth is not square. But wherever the four corners are, that's where they were. Holding back the four winds of the earth that the wind might not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. Now keep that in mind. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to the four angels, to whom it was given to damage the earth and the sea, saying, Do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Now, Someone had a question, since these are servants of God, are these people converted because they're called the servants of God? Or is this telling us what they will be doing after they are raised from the dead? Okay. Where do we have it? 
about God calling someone his servant who was not converted because I have said that the sealing is the conversion, but yet they're called the servants of God before they were sealed. Now, is that a declaration of what they will be after they are sealed, or because they have been specially called, they're already marked out as servants, yet converted shortly after that? That's what it would have to be. Now, where do we have it that unconverted have been called the servants of God? Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel in Jeremiah is called three times my servant Nebuchadnezzar. He wasn't converted, but he was his servant. All right? Romans 13, what does it say of those civil servants, the police and things like this? They are the servants of God. Well, for what? That doesn't mean they're converted because they're called the servants of God. They're there because God is given that power to the civil governments in order that there can be some kind of order among the nations without lawlessness ravaging everything. Look, look at what's happening in Mexico right now with all the lawlessness. I forget from what year it has, but it not, too, not too long ago. What, what year was it? 2009? I think that was the year. Somewhere right there, over 200,000 murders in Mexico. Look at it today. Lawless as can be. In Isaiah, in Isaiah, where is that? I had it written down. Isaiah 41 and Isaiah 44. Yes, it, Israel is called the servant of God. All right? Question. Let's look back in recent history. Yeah, it was Cyrus, but there was Cyrus, and uh, Cyrus may have been uh, the son of Ahasuerus and Esther. Okay. But he wasn't converted. He was called a servant of God. Okay. Israel was called the servant of God. How did God... Okay, let's back up. How does God take care of the nations today? Does he have hands off and they just do whatever they want to do? How does he run the world? Okay. Number one. Above the people, you have angels and demons. Below them, you have leaders, like Cyrus, and like whoever the leader of the country is. Okay. What does God say concerning all nations? Does he keep track of what's going on? Yes, he does. He's got what? He has seven eyes going around looking for those who are seeking God. Okay, we have that. Remember when you read in the book of Daniel that Gabriel and Michael, Gabriel had to go help Michael fight because he was warring against the prince of Persia, which had to be the demon that was trying to take over Persia. Okay. And God had it so that Cyrus would be the one who would come and conquer Babylon. And after he did that, he put Darius in as the king of Babylon. Okay? So God has, through that, he is judging the nations. And whether they do good or whether they do evil comment was made that 
was said of the servant of God, Nebuchadnezzar. Now think of this. That he rules in the kingdoms of men, and Nebuchadnezzar was the one who said this as well. Daniel said it first, and then Nebuchadnezzar did later. And he sets up over them the basest of men. Okay? All right. Now let's come to Jeremiah 18. Let's see how God always works. And let's ask the question, do you think that during World War II that America especially, Britain secondarily, were servants along with even Russia, as bad as Russia was, to get rid of Hitler? Yes. Okay. Because we won the war, right? Okay. So here, Jeremiah 18. And this goes on all the time. We'll see. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was working on his wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was ruined in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel. Very interesting, isn't it? Okay. Who is the potter? God is, individually. We are the clay. He made us physically right. Is that not going to come to an end? Yes. So, what is the other part of it? A spirit body and spirit mind. Okay. Which God will form for us. Okay. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you even as this potter says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So when God wants something done, he will get it done. Through his angels, through changing leaders, through however means of doing. Okay? Now here's what's going on at all times. Because notice, he changes from Israel to other kingdoms and nations. Verse 7, If at any time I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it. Did that not happen? World War II? Europe and Asia? Yes, indeed. If, I also have someone who, uh, I'll have to bring a separate sermon on this. Someone wrote me a letter and said, well, I disagree with you with independent free moral agency. Why then do we have an if? And why does God say choose? If we were robots, he wouldn't have to do that. It'd be automatic, right? Okay. Verse 7, If at any time I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken will turn from their evil. Isn't that interesting? The only nation ever to repent in the history of the Bible was the nation of Assyria through the city of Nineveh. You can read that in the book of Jonah. Only nation. So if they turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. And if at any time I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build it, to plant it. So I would say, keep your eyes on China. See? Now, look at it today with America. There's quite a bit going on to turn from abortion. Quite a bit going on getting laws that they can't have abortion if there's a heartbeat. Okay? There's quite a few going for outlawing 
abortion altogether. And really, with the amount of birth control that's available to people today, there should not be any abortions at all. Okay? So, maybe if things turn out for the good with this coming election, God is giving us a little space of time as a nation, and that will benefit mostly the churches of God to give them a chance to preach the gospel and bring a warning message. Okay? So that's just right here in America. But what about China? Verse 10. Because he, he has been building up China, and China is going to be built up. But maybe it's going to have a little setback. Okay? If it does evil in my sight, that it not obey my voice, then I will repent of the good which I had said I would do to them. Okay? So maybe there's going to be a setback for China for a while. Okay? All things that God is going to do is going to be giving an opportunity to preach the gospel. Okay? So God is looking at all nations and all people all the time. Back here to Revelation 7. Okay? Okay. We finish verse 3, the servants of our God in their forehead. Now, just take put this in your notes. Ephesians 1, 13. Ephesians 1, 13. That after you believed, you were sealed with the spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Okay, so receiving the Spirit is being sealed. So even though they are called the servants of God, they were not yet sealed. This probably ties in with Ezekiel 9 about those who sigh and cry for the sins and so forth. Okay. Okay, so it says, Do not damage the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 out of every tribe of the children of Israel. Then it lists all of them. Now that's a special calling. Think of that. God has it numbered down to the very person. Now how God is going to do that, don't know. But think of this. If you're in captivity, how many ministers are there to go around and baptize and lay hands and pray for the Holy Spirit? None. So this is why the angel does the job. Couldn't be done any other way. Okay? Now, then there's the great innumerable multitude, which no one could number out of every relation and language and so forth. Now then, what does it say of these? Okay, verse 14. Then I said to him, when asked who they are, he said, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. All right? And have washed their robes and have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are ever before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And the one who sits on the throne shall dwell among them. But when do they get there? They don't get there until what? The resurrection. Because they only come there when Christ returns, right? Didn't we see that? Okay. So some people look at that and say, well, look, they went right to heaven. Okay. That's why you have to know and, and understand the main guidepost as all of these things come along. 
So let's go ahead and take a little break and we'll come back. In the Old Testament, there are prophecies and there are clues that are given. So the rest of the Bible answers these prophecies and answers these clues. But you need to know how to study the Bible. And you need our Bible. You need the Holy Bible in its original order, a faithful version. And with it, we will send you the booklet which shows the difference between 27 modern translations and the faithful version, and the faithful version has everything that it should be from the original Hebrew and the original Greek, and the other translations have additions and deletions all the way through. You probably never knew that. So you go to faithfulversion.org and check out the Bible online.